I'm Tracy Cruz, the producer of Neo Soul TV, and welcome to the launch of Between the Lines. The reason for the rhyme, exploring what's on the mind of the artist. And here we have Gerald and Tia, and I'm giving it to y'all. We appreciate that, uh, Tracy. And today you are the artist, you are the creator, you are the founder, you are the brain behind all of this. So we're gonna let you relax a little bit and we're gonna ask you a few questions. There was a time when happy meant gay. Well, my passions were my Barbies and candy. My biggest worry were, when could I go out to play? For sunshine, I would pray. Is this my predestination by nature of my mother's womb? Her blood is in me. Is this what I must be? I'm terribly sorry, young lady. There seems to have been a mistake. Would you please go ask Miss Jackson to join us? I am Miss Jackson. Oh, I'm Mr. Russell. How are Hi. you? Hi. Nice to meet you. Latifa Shanika Jackson. That's me in the flesh. I could never have your baby. Look, this is not your baby. Look, this is not your fault. You were victimized. I wish I could put my hands on this sorry ass. Baby, we'll work it out, okay? Maybe not. Baby, I'm sorry. I'm, look, I know. I know I should have told you sooner, but I didn't want to lose you. You're afraid to kill me. You disrespect me and punish me because I live to cater to you, my husband. <laughs> what is wrong with me? What the hell is wrong with you? I treat you like a diamond. And Brandy treats you like shit. I love her, but I know she left him on the hand. <laughs> well, get on up, girl. Take care of your business. You know what? I'm going to do it. Oh, oh my gosh, she's coming in, coming in, coming in. We got to help her, girl, because you know she's going to start but all that. What I'm saying is, I can't do it. I can't do it. Go on, girl. Remember to breathe. Breathe. Go, go, go. Let me get my sexy walk on. My girl, this is just a regular person. We all breathe the same air. So tell us, Tracy, what's your background? My background? Yes. Okay, I am a retired seamstress, unknown, famous, not a household name designer. I graduated from the Art Institute, um, moved to Georgia, um, got into, fell into education. It was a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in education 21 years now. Well, November will be 21 years. Um, I'm a poet, I write. Oh gosh, this is hard, you know. <laughs> um, I'm not you used to, that, being, know I'm so not used to being on this side of the camera, but um, I love creativity, period. That's why, you know, the fashion design, um, spoken word, and from doing the poetry, I wanted to do a spoken word television show. And so apparently Russell Simmons and I, we were, we had the same intentions the same time, but he just had more money to launch it quicker than I did. But anywho, um, that's how Neo Soul TV came about. Um, I was trying to get a spoken word television show on and I called around, you know, suggesting to various channels and then I stumbled across People TV and I said, well, how come y'all don't have a spoken word TV show? And so they said, oh, well, why don't you make one? I said, what? I can make a TV show. They said, yeah, um, People TV is TV for the people, of the people, by the people and everything. So I said, okay, great. And see, I always wanted to do something like that in Philadelphia, but um, Comcast, every time I would they would always change the rules um, when I would try to do it there. But then here in Atlanta, they just took me in, my kids in, and I've been doing this ever since May of 2001. 
when did you fall in love yeah. with what you're doing right now with neo soul with production with poetry when did you fall in love with it i've been in love with poetry since when i saw for color girls the actual stage play, I, I can't remember whether it was the Locust Street Theater or the Schubert, and I actually seen Ntozaki Shane Gang, mm -hmm. and the play was bomb. You know, it was good. I didn't want to go, I wanted to be out in the streets, but my aunt took me along, and I was blown away by the play. I said it was a little heavy, but we needed that. And, but when at the end of the play, and Tazaki Shange came out. She sat on the edge of the stage, the lip of the stage, spread her legs, and she started reading her poetry herself and throwing the pages. I said, that bitch is bad. And I was, I, I mean, I'm just, she blew, she blew me away then. And so then that's when I fell in love with spoken word. And it. I started following, um, at that time, there was a lady, she's known in Philly, she's deceased now, Maddie Humphreys. Um, she was along, she's friends with Sonia Sanchez and Giovanni. Um, Maya Angelou, you know, that goes without saying, but um, is it Oscar Brown? I, I love, I love spoken word. And and so the piggyback off of that, what was your first project and what was the first project that you were proud of? Because they may not be one and the same. Oh, and they are not. <laughs> <laughs> they are not. Oh, wow. Um, okay, I'll put it to you this way. I can't remember his name. Um, I sh after I had that nervous breakdown and... My ex-husband left. And so um, I picked, I was like, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? And I blah, blah, blah. This is not, not even monetarily. It was just emotionally. I was feeling like a failure because I wanted, you know, I wanted this family, this, you know, and everything. And, and, so, I, and so it wasn't monetarily what I was going to do, but it was more so, may, I guess, emotionally physically and you know family wise but um I looked at the pen and I started writing a lot of that's and I for whatever reason I shared that with my um one of my co-workers I the nervous breakdown started at 9 p.m on a Thursday night mm -hmm. and I kept writing up until five that morning because I was working in King of Prussia at, I was working at, I don't even, yeah, King of Prussia, Lord and Taylors. And so I sh shared my um, poetry with one of my coworkers and they were like, oh my God, this is so cute. This is so touching. And I thought it was a bunch of junk. So fast forward, um, it was Naomi's Seafood Cafe on Fairmount Avenue they used to have an um, open mic. And so the guy that facilitated that, he was like, your poetry is nice, but you need to go deeper. You need to go deeper. You're holding back. And he was right. So then fast forward to Atlanta, I finally did write something. I went all the way there, still kind of holding back, but it was, I was opening up as much as I could at that time. And I wrote a piece called Call Me By My Name. And it addressed, you know, I'm a, you know, I went through domestic violence and I addressed that. So to answer your question, the Call Me By My Name is the piece that a lot of people do kind of know me by. And that was the first piece that I really kind of went there with. Okay, and so is that the first piece that you're proud of? Yeah, I guess so, because a lot of people like that piece. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I'm proud of it. Yeah, all, yeah, I'm proud of it. And yeah, I'm proud of it. Thank you. So let's say we could travel back in time and 
do all these great things, and you were at a table with your younger self. What advice would you give young Tracy? Um, what advice I would give young Tracy? Love yourself, and this too shall pass. Why those two things? Because younger Tracy was kind of either black or white about things. There were hardly any shades of gray. And so everything was intense to younger Tracy. And everything was like so urgent, urgent, urgent. I was, ugh. and I didn't think things would pass. You know, I, I, I stayed in that moment all the time. It was hard for me to go through certain things. So I would say, this too shall pass. And not really having a good self-worth. I would say, love yourself. You ain't that bad, girl. You great. God made you. Yeah, wait, um, what's the scripture? Um, marvelously made. I can't think of it. It was, you're, you're wondrously and marvel marvelously made, that scripture, yeah. That's what you I'm are, saying. and your and your story speaks to that. Until the hurt stops, I scream aloud, not saying a word, wanting and needing to be heard. But do you hear me? Do you ask yourself why I cry? Trying to ascertain how you cannot feel my pain, life strain, taking a toll on my heart, my soul, my body, and my brain. You do not refrain. We are. Oh, bird want to play a little game with you. Come sit on my lap, girl. Now, this is a very special game, so you can't tell nobody, okay? But this game is called You Show Me Yours. And I'll show you mine. Do you not see what you are doing to me, invading my privacy, touching me privately in my private parts? My private parts, you prematurely explore my youth and innocence, you selfishly ignore. So now I scream. I scream at the top of my lungs. My joy has been far flung. Ken and Barbie, I see differently. Adult grins are now twisted to me. I scream. You show me yours, I'll show you mine. I scream to block your heavy breathing in my ear. I scream because now I live in fear. I scream to wash you from my skin. I scream because I didn't know how not to let you in and you promised, you promised to never do it again. I scream because I still feel my private pain and I scream because now I will never be the same. I scream to get God's attention. I scream because you don't want me to mention. I scream while I pray to die because of how you make me feel inside and forget I tried, but for me, for me, for me, I cannot hide. And I scream and I scream and I scream and I scream and I will scream. And I will scream. Until the hurt stops. From what we know of you thus far and your background, your story, um, who do you who do you admire or what influences, you know, have you had in your life, you know, that kind of taking your work to the next level? I have my, okay. I have, it's, it's a, it's a trifecta. I will have to say to some degree, even though my mom wasn't the greatest supporter, but one thing she did say don't wait on anybody to do anything. 
and you know be like just do it don't wait on anybody so i i do have a lot of that i try not to wait and be dependent on you know i do what i can do within where i am and then um on a i like spike lee and tyler perry for the same a lot of the same reasons i, I have great respect for um tyler perry and you know i like spike lee because he's one of the first black successful you know filmmakers out there that i know of um and and then a lot of the women that i watched growing up and just seeing you know mother washington um Allie white they were powerful powerful women yeah my grandma <laughs> Yeah. Love grandma. Yeah. They they made things happen and seemingly out of nothing. And so, yeah. Okay. They 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 got me going. And I do I, I don't I and I do gotta say Oprah ish too. I do gotta throw her in there because she had a she wasn't the typical beauty. She wasn't the um typical journalist type and she built an empire. So yeah, Oprah does influence me too okay that's interesting you said oprah because one of the things i think that helped her success was that she shared her story she went really deep with her life and you are also a, a huge proponent of that you really encourage the people that you work with and that work under you that you teach to be open and be free and to share so with that being said is there a piece of work that you'd like to share with us? Maybe um, a portion of a script that you have laying around somewhere or your favorite poem, Call Me By My Name. Is there anything you'd like to share? Well, you know what? That was a good one, Tia. That was, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will share Call Me By My Name because that's only fitting because it is the first work that I did go into. Um, you know what though? Wait a minute, now I gotta find it. Oh, see, I have a book. All see, right, tell us about the book while you're looking for what you have to find. Well, see, this is the pretty one, Unbroken Spine, but this is my personal one. Um, the Chronicles, the um, the Chronicles of the Epic Misadventures of a Grown-Up Ghetto Girl, Volume One. Volume One is life interrupted and it's emotional. There are three, three or four volumes, but this is the start. And the reason why I started with Life Interrupted because this Life Interrupted was my mom's favorite poem of mine. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to find it. I have to look in the table of contents to, um, find it. Will you just, uh, take your time? Page 90. Here we go. Okay. Call me by my name. Do not hit me anymore. And my name is not Hey Bitch. If we do not stop these malproductive negative displays of emotion, we will be burying another family in a fatherless hellish ditch on an enemy I would not wish. I am not a pin cushion to be poked and to be pulled on at your delight. I'll say to you, baby, the mortgage is due. Where's your paycheck? And now, now you want to fuss, cuss, and fight. And then later, you're so very sorry, baby, please, baby, please, and want to do it all night. That ain't right. 
I am not a pin cushion. And your penis is not a magic wand. It rises, then you wave it, and it ceases all the world's miseries and harm. The bill collector don't care about your bedroom skills, how you make me feel, though you do thrill and chill. It's not enough. And that's what makes it so ill. Our children get the raw end of the deal. Now you want to. I'm sorry. Now we need time to heal. Or do you even care? Or do you even feel I'm going to stop? That's a portion of Call Me By My Name. And I wanted you to keep going. And as you were, you know, presenting that. So we're, we're, we're in a very inter interesting time um, in America. Um, but as you were presenting that, Tracy, and the, the things that you were saying, I could, I was just imagining America and the black race. So there were several points that you made where I felt like America at some point was screwing us over, trying to take advantage of us, or think trying to put a Band-Aid on a gunshot sh um, wound, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't. And as a black man, living in this time, knowing that I was born in this world with a target on my back, mm -hmm. it just puts me in a different space. And it, and your words and just your growth as a artist and how you've taken some things from your past and turned them into, like, like they say, you, you made lemonade out of a bunch of lemons. It, it, it's made me think about a sense of accountability that I need to, you know, stand on as a black man, as a person who, who, who's gone along this journey with other black men and women and to truly take a stance in this free country that we know it to be and to truly prepare ourselves and our youth for what's to come because i thought coming in this world in 1991 and going to school and being in school at 2000 thinking hey that just happened maybe 50 years ago slavery was x amount of time ago that's not going to happen to us but here we are i have personal friends who've been arrested the last 24 hours personal friends who've been hit with rubber bullets personal friends who've been just hurt and so the pain that you experience and the pain that i experienced as a black man and you as a black woman i'm living in this world where our lives aren't valued in the way that they should be one thing that does keep me motivated is art and it is right. poetry and i heard one um spoken word artist say as black people we're dipped in bronze but we have the value of gold mm. Mm. So you you are that golden Oscar statue for us right now, Tracy. You are that person, and so we appreciate you. And we have some more questions. So don't think this is the end, because I have a I have a good juicy question I want to ask too. Uh oh. Well, go ahead, ask. I'm scared. <laughs> so off record, I want to know because you you mentioned um a few professionals before, some um colleagues of yours. Who is your industry like? This is not real, just imaginary, or it could happen one day. Who's your industry husband? Like, who do you, who's that man that you just love? Like, you, what did they say in um, The Color Purple? I can drink your bath water. Uh, mm. Well, one of them, I, okay, yes, yeah, documented when we were at the ABFF. I love me some method, man. Yeah. I <laughs> But um, industry crush, my boy Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It needs to happen. We need to see a collab happen, like now. But you know what? I can't. I mean, like since you went there, we, I can't. I can't let you not go there. I mean, like living in the right now, and I know this is supposed to be about me, but I would be. I, it wouldn't be me if we didn't talk about like all of this pandemic and the um. Cause see, I'm a mother, and Tia, you a mom to a black son. I, I have a black son, and if something happened, I mean, if something happened 
child, this would, mm. So, and I, I'm nervous, even though he, you know, my son, Andrew, he gets on me because I'm like, I mean, he's 30, 30, he'll be 32 next month. And um, I'm like, how come you don't call me? How come you? And so now he's really starting to understand. I don't care if he's 52 and I'm in the grave. I worry about my son. But I mean, I worry about all of my kids because they're killing black women. They're doing these um, no-knock warrants. Um, it's like open season on us. And the looting and stuff, like you said, you had some friends that were shot. I'm not saying that they were looting, but you know, it's hard to tell the people that are innocently walking away and the ones that are, you know, causing mayhem. It's not about the looting, in my opinion. It's about why they are out there. Why are they congregating in the first place? Um, the insurance will kick in. And a lot of these businesses, because of the pandemic, they're going to come out with more money in the first place. So the looting did them a favor in my head. I'm just saying people, you know, people are not thinking about that. This was actually a blessing in disguise for a lot of businesses. But why are the people looting? Because their hearts are heavy, they're fed up, um, they're sick and tired of all of the killing before it was you know the kkk now it's the fop yeah federal order yeah it's it's just not it's just it's and just, just not very, it's um, not right very, very very valid point because i what i'm seeing on social media and a lot of the conversation i'm hearing is about people lose what what businesses shouldn't be touched. And every time I look online and I see video or I see um, picture photography, I don't, I don't see the destruction that's, that people are trying to create the narrative for. What I see is pain from the Rosewood massacre, pain from Bloody Sunday, pain from lynchings, pain from systematic injustice in America where we were once told was a, again a free country but we have to be reminded that America received 400 years of free labor and our ancestors paid the cost in their blood so when I look online and I see buildings on fire or I see cars looked over I see pain yes I agree and 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 just to to go a little farther with what Gerald is saying. When I see buildings on fire, I see history. I see some of the lessons that I learned back in 19 such and such in school when there was the French Revolution. You know, I don't think any oppressed group of people ever got what they wanted without fighting back without rioting. You know, we can look at even stuff here in our own country, the Boston Massacre. I saw a meme that even read all of the museums in this country, probably throughout the world, have artifacts that they looted. You know, where are their receipts for obtaining these artifacts? So, you know, looting should not be synonymous with Black rioting. It's, and, you know, rioting shouldn't be synonymous with Black people. You know, they were protesting. They were protest, protesting peacefully. Mm -hmm. There have been several uh, organizers that have stated that a lot of the protesters that came in that were not peaceful were not from their communities. That's right. I believe them. You know, so the pandemic has really exposed far much more than I think uh anyone was expecting I, most people just thought it would be a vaccine and we'd be outside by the summer and no one i don't think foresaw what has taken place over the past few days and i never imagined that in my lifetime i would live to see it but we're here and and as 
you know, media personalities and poets and writers. We, you know, this is our moment. We don't have to create content. There is no, fiction has nothing on real life. Yeah, amen. Man, the, a blessing behind, uh, like for our community, I'm proud when I, when I get online or when I'm having conversations with family members and they're making statements like, you know, though I'm frustrated with being in the house or I'm scared to go outside, I have saved more money than I've ever saved before. I have, I'm eating better. I have better control over my, over my mental health because I've, I've learned new, new, um, new hobbies. Again, going back just to the health with the whole sea moths and people are, are discovering just the magic behind turmeric and ginger and garlic and all those things and building your immune system. Um, I've been outside. I, I, I cannot say that I've been inside the whole time. I've been outside. I've been at the bars. I've been at the grocery stores. I have not wore a mask the entire time. But one thing that I have been conscious about doing is building my immune system with some of the natural ingredients that I know to be out there. So the fresh plants, the raw eating, to, again, build my immune system. I got a COVID test. Yes, it was very uncomfortable. Um, but thankfully, my test results came back negative. The bull fight. That's education. Had I just been indulging in so many food and beverages that make me no good and not just flip the script of my diet, maybe my test results would have came back a little different, but because I know better and I'm 